Now, we're here right next to Lincoln's Inn Fields in London, which is not that far away from the amazing cornucopia of theaters that are in the West End of, of London, right? This is, in some sense, the very heart of, of theaterdom on Earth. Mm -hmm. And Shakespeare, of course, and Shakespeare's Globe are certainly legendary central parts of that theater. But it wasn't always so, right? I mean, if we went back 500 years ago or 550 years ago, there weren't theaters dotting everywhere in London that were purpose-built to have you know, permanent acting companies performing in them, right? No, no. 500 years ago, it would have been very different indeed. And one of the things that happens in the 16th century is that there starts to be a move towards having purpose-built places for playing. Um, and some people writing in the 1570s actually talk about you know, houses of purpose-built. Um, to perform plays in. And this for them is something new and something that they find a bit, a bit threatening. Where were they performing before there were purpose-built theatres? So there's a variety of performance spaces that they're using. Um, we have some evidence that performing in inns, in private houses, um, sometimes even in, in churches or maybe churchyards. Um, but we also have evidence that particular playing venues cause problems or cause anxieties um, for the authorities in the city because of the commotion, because it might create chaos, or because it might be subversive to the political order? What were, what were they particularly worried about? It's often a combination of these things. So often it's public order. And we see this later in the century as well, that one of the great anxieties about the permanent or the purpose-built playhouses is that they, they provoke crowds. They bring people together who would otherwise not be in contact with mm -hmm. each other. And so there's a potentially dangerous circulation of all sorts of, of, all, of all sorts of things, so of ideas, um, but also of, of germs. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and crowds are are seen as, as dangerous in times of plague. So they wanted to make sure that well, things didn't get out of control. In this, in some sense, this is so you know wonderful for an economist because uh, you know one of the central themes of the economics of cities is that urban urban. You know, mass markets enable specialization. I mean, this is a central theme in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, that you know, in, in the highlands of Scotland, every farmer must be his own butcher, baker, and brewer, but in cities, we can have specialization. And so as London grew, what you're telling us is that increasingly you have specialized actors who can actually be sustained by a larger market, not just people who are sometimes rude artisans and sometimes sometimes uh, actors. And that's sort of an amazing, an amazing thing to sort of watch unfolding in 16th century London. Yeah, and I think that's a really good way of thinking about it, this idea of increasing specialisation, um, increasing um, order and standards in some ways, although there's a fair amount of chaos and disorder that always sure. surrounds theatre. Um, tell us about Shakespeare's Globe itself, the physical theatre. How did it get built? What, what, uh, what's the story? James Burbage in 1576 builds the theatre in Shoreditch, which is you know, one of the, the earlier of these purpose-built playhouses. And, and it's built on land owned by a man called Giles Allen. Mm -hmm. um, and they seem to kind of roll along relatively happily um, for a number of years. But it then comes to a point in the 1590s where the lease is coming up for renewal. And Giles Allen at that point is getting, seems to be getting a bit kind of edgy about the fact that he has a playhouse on his land. And he has some talks with James Burbage um, and then later with, with Burbage's sons. Um, about renewing this lease. But he at one point says that the lease needs to be shorter, he demands more money. He at one point seems to be arguing that actually after a few years the playhouse should be converted into, into housing, so converted into flats rather than carry on being a playhouse. And so what the Burbages seem to decide is that they need to take some more drastic action. And they um, figure that they don't own the land but they own the building that's on it. So they take the playhouse down, much to the disgust of Giles Allen, the landowner, and they transport the timbers um, to the South Bank, put them in storage, and then a few months later they build the Globe. So the Globe is, is kind of an adapted mm -hmm. building. It's a sort of second-hand playhouse in some ways. Mm -hmm. It's based on the timbers of the playhouse that have been, been relocated. But there's a number of lawsuits that come out of this. So Giles Allen, as I said, is not happy, um, feels that he's been thwarted and cheated out of you know, what's his, brings a series of lawsuits, one of them in a court called Star Chamber. Um, and to bring a case to Star Chamber, you have to claim that some kind of riot or violent outrage was involved. And so the language of this court case is incredibly charged. You know, Alan says that there's a group of, of basically thugs kind of arrived in the middle of the night. Um, and it was in the winter, um, so the, the scene that's set is, is a fairly vivid one. 
you know, armed with various kinds of you know, axes and, and what have you, and, and you know, lewdly and riotously and outrageously tore down the playhouse. Um, it probably wasn't as lewd and outrageous and riotous as, as Giles Allen tries to make out. Um, but it does lead to this quite long series of, of you know, lawsuits that move between the different, the different courts. Um, but in the end, Allen doesn't get anywhere, or d seemingly doesn't get anywhere. Um, the globe is built, mm -hmm. um, and you know, survives right through until sometime during the, the Civil War and Commonwealth, when it's finally, um, finally taken down.